Because a contract and home heart, he'll never, never uh, refuse to help and give him the grace he needs. I feel that uh, it's a privilege to work in this field. I owe much to my community. I, when Bill called me about this, I certainly could hardly think of appearing on a program like this. And as I said, well, it's something like the AA third step. We turn our life and our will over to God under the direction of our superior. My superiors might have sent word at any time that I would take no more. It came nearly to that, nearly to that point in a few cases. But thank God and the fervent prayers of well, I suppose many of the sisters who were interested, and our uh, little Dr. Bob, and Bill himself. Somehow we weathered it through. I'll just, uh, Bill asked me to say a few words about how we got started in Aspen. <clears throat> I hardly know myself. I was sent there in 1928, just as a well, it might be the doctor recommended occupational therapy, change of occupation for a while. I was in the field of music, and as you know, that's rather nerve-wracking. And, uh, <laughs> a change might uh, be good for me. So, um, I was sent to, to St. Thomas, which was just opened in 1928, and it was there I met Dr. Bob. We had an open staff the first year because we didn't know the men, nor did they know us. Doctor operated at our hospital and the other hospitals. <laughs> I didn't know they had a drinking problem, and in fact, I wouldn't have known it had he not told me so, because he didn't come to the hospital when he was drinking, evidently. Oh, I can recall uh, sometimes his voice was rather reverberating. I, <laughs> I could hear him when he came in the back door. He had a decided uh, English accent, I mean New England accent. But I, somehow I liked him because he was so, so straightforward. Those of us working on hospitals know that some doctors uh, make everything an emergency, a matter of life or death. Others will tell you the exact truth about the case. Say, well, my patient is going a few days, or if they can't, then you know that you take them for what they say. However, the doctor was so straightforward that I enjoyed working with him. And one day he called, he looked rather... Uh, down. We often had little chats, and um, this uh, morning they came in looked rather down. I said, Doctor, what's the trouble this morning? Well, then he told me, he said, well, sisters, he said, I might as well tell you that um, uh, I came in contact with a New York broker and uh, that had a drinking problem for a long time and somehow we got together and we vowed try to work out something that will help these drunks he said well <clears throat> he said we've uh, been trying it out they tried a few rest homes and uh, he had some in the other hospitals and he said sister would you consider taking one? Well, I hesitated because sometime before, oh, probably some months before, I took a man in who, oh, he looked, um, I didn't, I didn't know much about this drinking. I knew some could drink, <laughs> and some could drink and have it, well, others couldn't. So uh, they called me to the emergency, and I went down and talked with him. Oh, he said, just like I just lie down a little while. He worked at the city garage and looked like a very respectable person. He said, I've been drinking a little too much, and I want to get straightened out. 
which I thought was a good thing. <laughs> well, the only bed that uh, we had at the time was a bed in a four-bedroom. Then we knew nothing about uh, special treatment, and uh, I signed to the man on service, on medical service, and registered him, put him to bed, and I said, you won't cause any trouble. Oh, no, he'd be an angel. <laughs> well, I forgot about him. When I came over early the next morning, the night supervisor, who was tall, sister, we all teach her about her big feet, well, she was standing at the door waiting for me. She said, the next time you take a DT in this place, please stay up all night and run around after him as we have. <laughs> mm. That wasn't the end of it either. I decided then that that's enough. I often felt sorry to see them turned away, but I was not the last word in the hospital. So when doctor proposed my taking a real, uh, as I thought, a real <laughs> well, you can imagine my misgivings. I said, oh, dear me. I, I told him about this experience, and I said, doctor, I'm not only... Well, I be put out, but I said, the patients and everything else, I said, I don't think they want alcoholics. So he said, Sister, this patient won't give you a bit of trouble because I will, I will medicate him, I'll assure you. Well, I had much confidence in him because he never said anything that wasn't so. I'd always say that. Well, very fearfully, I said, well, doctor, I shall take him then and put him in a two-bedroom. I thought I was doing pretty well because we were so crowded in those days and uh, beds were rather premium. So I took him to this two-bedroom. Doctor, pardon me, doctor went up and medicated him and everything. And I thought, well, I figured I wouldn't hear much till the next morning anyway if there was any trouble. So uh, there was a word about it. Doctor then came to the attending office. Thank you. He said, Sister, would you mind putting my patient in a private room? I thought I had done pretty good to put him in a two-bed. <laughs> he said, you know, they, he said there'll be some... Men come to visit him, and they like to talk to him privately. Well, I uh, said, I'll do what I can, doctor. After he left, I went up and looked the situation over. And right across the hall, we had a flower room where we used to prepare the patient's flowers. And I thought, well, they can fix their flowers somewhere else for today, and I believe I could push the bed in there. <laughs> That's what we did. And his visitors came. We kept a close eye on them. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it was all you. And I thought, well, my, the respectable-looking men, they don't know that they ever took a drink. <laughs> and uh, went along. I thought, now the next time, I won't have this trouble, and I'll put him in a private room. So the next one that came along, I put in a private room. And, uh, he, uh, seen, I didn't know much about these alcoholics. I was not an expert, surely, the Lord picked out a, a weakling when he picked out me, I know. But, um... However, I took him down to the room, as I would any patient, and then was taking the chart to the desk to explain to the nurse a little about it. I couldn't tell her too much, but said so Dr. Bob would, uh, would give her the orders. And wasn't he down after me? <laughs> well, he had his short tongue and everything else. <laughs> I nearly went through the floor because the nurses all looked and everyone 
And I said, you go right back to the room, right down. So the nurse came down with me. And here he was under the bed. <laughs> well, I thought this will never work. I don't believe this will go at all. I better put two together the next time. I didn't want to give up at once. I don't know just exactly what I did, whether I uh, had someone stay with him or what I did. But I know after that, I put them, uh, put two together and then finally took a four-bedroom. That seemed to go pretty good. One would help the other. Usually, one or two would be in a few days before they'd be coming out of it pretty well. And um, so then we took another two bed across the hall. Well, it was hard to say no when they really wanted to do something about it. And by that time, the men were coming in quite often. So much so that some of the sisters said, who are these fine looking men that come in so often and seem so interested in the patients? And uh, I didn't say much at first, but I later I said, well, that is AA. I said, what is AA? Would you like to know something about it? Well, yes. Well, I'll bring some literature. <laughs> <laughs> I gradually got them. But, of course, before that, a committee from Alcoholics Anonymous talked with Sister Superior. She was one who had a lot of experience in the old days of charity and all. And uh, she knew what we were doing. And she said uh, to these men, she said, well, uh, strange, she said, when we had them at charity, they'd be running around the halls and doing a lot of trouble. But since Dr. Bob is treating them, we don't know that they're in the house. So she said, there's no problem. As far as I can see, just go right along. Well, that was wonderful. But that wasn't all, of course. Then later the patients uh, complained because they couldn't have visitors at any time. As these AAs did, they seemed like such privileged characters. <laughs> so finally, they decided to, we had a small accident war. It was sort of off from the rest of the uh, hospital. And there we put in a coffee bar and Dr. Bob set up the program. I uh, want to tell you that the first opportunity he had, he brought Bill over. And, uh, of course, I couldn't imagine who this wonderful Bill was. But I soon learned that uh, God had chosen two great men. What one didn't have, the other supplemented. And together, they were perfect I could just see, I often say to our boys, had God picked out two great religious leaders, no one would have come near them because the alcoholic doesn't want anything about religion or God, nor do we try to preach religion to them. But they aren't in for very long until they're asking or telling you what experience they've had and what they'd like to do. They know they haven't been living right and I feel that, as many of our nurses have said, the best set of this peace of mind. If once they can be relieved of their anxieties and worries and treated properly, there should be no trouble. First, when we first come in and uh, Dr. Uh, set up the program, no televisions, no radios, no newspapers, only literature pretending to AA or something that would have a, a moral, I mean, a building of their morals and things of that kind. Because they don't, they have all the reading they can take care of and then their visitors, too. Well, we went on with that. There's, there are many details I could bring in, but I don't want to make it too long because I know many of you have probably questions that maybe Colonel Towns could answer some of these people who know much more than I. But anyway, during doctor's time, I think we treated before between four and five thousand. And he treated them, he came in every day unless he was out of town or something like that. And uh, without any charge, he said, that's my contribution to AA. 
course, in those days, they didn't have too much either to start with. And you couldn't mention money very well or how much it would cost because if we just get them sober, it would mean a great deal. But that was taken care of later on. Thank God. It worked out very well. And there are no problems. Oh, many times, whether they have it or don't, we take them in because God certainly provides. And a man who gets this problem is everlastingly grateful. Doctors, um, it was hard to understand. Sometimes you'd make rounds and they'd come down and they'd say, Sister, let that man go home. He doesn't want this problem. Oh, but doctor has a big family and he has to set me up. Doesn't want the problem, sister. He isn't ready. So he was always right. Many times they'd frighten me you know, because they'd have a heart attack or they would tell me they had a bad heart or something. And I hated to bother the doctor too much. Often I'd call Ann. I think members of this group or any alcoholic should often say a prayer for Ann. Because she was the backbone of this. In her calm, quiet way, she was really an angel. I would call her and say, Oh, Ann, I'm so worried about this fellow. She knew most of them from either reputation or doctor telling about them. And uh, she would get the doctor if it was anything serious, but otherwise she said, Now, don't worry about them. Because well, they have a... They have a... Um, they're allobiologists, in other words. <laughs> and I learned they were. <laughs> they do anything to uh, promote another drink or treatment of some kind. So, well, <clears throat> uh, we take them but once. That was Doctor's plan, too. I thought, oh my, that's kind of strict, isn't it? But, oh, I see the wisdom of it. Because if there is a merry-go-round, when that temptation comes, you're going to think, well, I can get back in there for five or six days. Well, that would be all right. Sister's good. She'll take me back. And I'd only be encouraging my drinking. They know that it's a one-way trip. The sponsors, and as uh, Colonel Town said, they are... Their cooperation is tremendous. Any hospital who tries to just take them in on their own is very foolish because they need this sponsorship. I often say it's something like learning the technique of crawl. You may know all the angles and all the rules, but unless you get out there in the field and do some footwork and practice, you won't be much of a golfer. So we tried, Dr. Felt, if they could be take, uh, taken out of their environment. At first, it was just five days because people were pretty depleted after the depression and all, uh, financially. And uh, the sooner we got them back to their family, the better. Although many of those first AAs would take them into their own homes and try to help indoctrinate them. They worked in groups. It was marvelous what they did. But however, we uh, certainly have uh, uh, found that it was very wise because the sponsor will not bring them until they are ready. And then we, he screens them carefully and goes over it. We want to be sure the sponsor is not just a person they met in a bar somewhere. Uh, but uh, one, I usually have some what groups are attending. Of course, now I know most of them well, know who are good sponsors and who are not. But it's a tremendous help. So finally, <coughs> we, um, um, the time came. Well, uh, Anne, of course, died in 49. And that was very hard for doctors. He called from the Cleveland airport. They had just gotten in from Texas, and the plane was grounded. It wasn't Bill. <coughs> Bill knows more about this than I. Anyway, they brought her directly to the hospital. And we kept doctor there, too, because he was 
pretty well shaken up with all this. And Ann died of pneumonia and all that. So uh, went on from there. Doctor then died in 1950, a year and a half later. He knew then, I believe, that he had a emergency. He had talked with Bill. Well, I think that several times a week, if not every other day, he'd give me a little message. And uh, I felt as though <clears throat> I knew Bill and his guiding spirit, too, because there wasn't very much done that they didn't consult together on, especially anything affecting this, the foundation of this. Then uh, one day I got worried. We're just like people in the army, you know. We go to where we're sent. I often wondered whether I was off the mailing list or whether I was forgotten. <laughs> I, was, I was there for uh, 24 years, probably one week short of 24 years, and uh, finally the obedience came. So I was to go to charity and uh, work with AA there. They had had AA at charity and fine workers there, but they just had a small department. And Sister Victorine, a very fine sister, who everybody loved, was there too. And she came down and we told her everything and Dr. Bob talked with her. And she really did a good job. But uh, they decided to build a new wing and all the extra. Oh, I know they thought uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was a frill then or not, but uh, everything was discontinued. It wasn't absolutely a case of life or death. So they <clears throat> just kind of forgot about AA. But Reverend Mother didn't. She saw much good in it, I know. I went there in August, and I didn't hear a word. About other than on my obedience, it said uh, that I was to take care of this floor and uh, visit these patients and work with AA. Well, I knew someday maybe we'd have them. But anyway, I just observed and went along day by day. Finally, one day, I got a call. I was in surgery checking on the patient to see if I'm not the condition. And we were worried about this patient, and the bell rang furiously and said, Superior wants you, she's on your floor. And I came down, and the architect of the new building was there, and um, a few nurses, uh, the director of our nursing service was there, and uh, of course, uh, Superior said, What kind of a setup would you like for this AA? Well, you imagine standing in the middle of the floor and feeling rather strange. I didn't know whether I was at home myself or not just yet. And I uh, couldn't think very fast. So this nurse uh, said, uh, well, sister, are they violent? I said, no, they're not violent. Oh, they're not intoxicated. Yes, they are intoxicated. <laughs> but they're clear enough to be screened because we must make sure that they want the person. Well, she said to the architect, you won't need those cages then. <laughs> well, I said, I said, and as you're rocking, would you mind, give me a few days and we'll drop a little plan of what we'd like. Fine. Well, the day that they came was on the beach of our Lady the Rosary, that's how we called it, Rosary Hall. And there is a uh, Connected with that, when I was moved there, I thought, oh, I'd love to have this in memory of Dr. Bob. Well, I thought if I get permission, rather than call it the alcoholic ward, we'll call it Rosary Hall. And I was thinking, Martin, their robes, R.H. Well, I thought all I need is a mess, and I have doctor's initials, R.H.S. Robert Holbrook Smith. So we call it Rosary Hall Solarium. <laughs> Insignia on the door is RHS. 
for Miss Noble Warren is granted by the hospital authorities on October 7, 1952. Peace of most holy rosary. I feel that to people, whether they're in the church or out, whatever the denomination, when you see a rosary, you know it means prayer. People get the rosary out, well, you think they're praying somehow. So to everyone, I think this is all a result of someone's prayer. The grace of God comes through someone's prayer and penance, that's for sure. Well, anyway, the, uh, is the Seraphim Main Rosary Hall, Solarium. Well, I told you about that. The insignia eloquently expresses the efforts of the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine, a Catholic religious order, as they join forces with the members of AA, a strictly non-sectarian movement, in an attempt to rescue men and women of all creeds from the bottomless pit of alcoholism. To be admitted to this award, you must be sponsored by a member of AA in good standing. You must also evidence a desire not just to get sober, but also preserve and perpetuate your sobriety on a day-by-day basis. Unless you yourself are willing to admit that you are an alcoholic, you are advised to seek help otherwise, elsewhere. The physical therapy is the most modern known to medical science. The patient's entire stay is a retirement from the outside world and the habits which has, have caused his collapse. There are no radios, televisions, um, newspapers, or magazines. Nothing but AA literature and other literature in keeping with the programs are available. The patient may have no visitors except members of Alcoholics Anonymous who are welcome between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. The conversation is turned to alcoholism and its ravaging problems. Every evening, a member of AA comes to the hospital to conduct a brief AA meeting with the patients and attract a coffee bar stands in the center of the hall where AA members and the patients often gather to discuss their common problems. A little oratory is open at all times. Just if they want to do some prayerful thinking, it's there. The remodeling and construction work for the solarium was done by members of AA who contributed their time and money. Members who belong to the building trades work day and night during these spare hours to complete the lovely quarters at no cost to the hospital. Rosary Hall accepted its first person one year ago, and since that date, 1,000 men and women have been hospitalized therein. We have much room for women. We're hoping to get more. Oh, we have three. We have, Usually we have three, sometimes four, and even a stretch to five, but that isn't good. However, uh, the remodel of uh, Rosie Hall accepted his first patient one year ago, and since that date, well, pardon me for repeating, they have been offered not only the key to sobriety, but also the key to a happy sobriety. The Sisters of Charity and members of Alcoholics Anonymous, who have assisted them, have declined any individual credit. They are aware that it is in giving we receive. Well, God bless you all, and I wish you a continued happy sobriety, and, uh, May God's grace be with you always and bless every one of you. Thank you.